Good to have you here. Would you like to open the uh, lesson a word of prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity of being here this morning. Uh, Lord, we just want to invite you into our church um, uh, today. And Lord, we just ask that you uh, teach us something new, Lord, that we, we've never heard before. And Lord, we just ask that you guide and direct the wisdom to set for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. For those... Uh, who are new with us today, welcome. Thank you for being here. We're going through, this is our Bible class time, where we're going through our what we call our doctrinal statement, what we believe as a church. And uh, last week we started part one on um, the sovereignty of God, which is a big subject amongst Christianity when you think about it, uh, and especially what's entailed in the idea of the sovereignty of God. So if we went to the next slide, thanks. This is our statement as a church. God is absolutely sovereign. And in his sovereignty, he gave man a free will to accept or reject salvation that he had provided. It is God's will that all will be saved and that none should perish. He foreknows, but he does not predetermine any man to be condemned. God permits man's destiny to depend upon man's choice. The reason why we have that statement there is for a number of reasons. The, the main reason why we have this statement in regards to absolute sovereignty and the explanation of his sovereignty and free will, foreknowledge predetermine is because there's a lot of different isms out there and there's Calvinism. What was the other one after? No, no, looking at your books. I said the pop, pop quiz. Arminian, Arminianism. Antinomianism. All right. So they are big words for different theological understandings and uh, Calvinism we know, which we'll look at a little bit more this morning. John Calvin, obviously one of the major reformers that came out of the Roman Catholic Church along with Luther and Zwingli and uh, began what we know as Reformed theology because they took the Roman Catholic theology and reformed it uh, along with the Puritans and so on and so forth. Their five points of tulip, if you haven't heard of that, this is their five tenets, I guess, of faith. They believe in the total depravity of man, which we're going to look at majorly this morning because we didn't get to it last week. Because in their idea of total depravity, they would say that man is that depraved that he cannot choose. All right, you cannot choose God. God has to choose. God elects. God predetermines and so on. Unconditional election, limited atonement. Irresistible grace, which means you cannot resist the grace of God, or they call it now irresistible call, where you can't resist the call of God, and then the perseverance of the saints. All right, so that's the five points of Calvinism. Then we look very quickly at Arminianism, uh, and that's a little bit of background about jo Jacob Arminius. Next slide. And then we saw the differences between Calvinism and Arminianism. And, and we said last week that if you spoke to someone and you said you weren't a Calvinist, they put you in the Arminianist box. And if you say, well, I'm not an Arminianist, then they'll put you in the Calvinist box. Everyone's got to, everyone feels comfortable when you put someone in a box, right? Who, knows, who understands that God's not put in a box? Right? God's not in a box, but we like to put him in a box, right? So total depravity of Calvinism, total depravity here, unconditional election, Prevenient grace, limited atonement, atonement for all, irresistible grace, resistible grace, perseverance in light of security in Christ or the preservation of the saints. Then we looked at antinomianism, which I was surprised that not too many people knew about antinomianism. Uh, antinomianism was something that came into being because they believed that once you got saved, you were no longer under the law, which I agree with. By, and by the way, I said this last week, I look at some of the things that Calvinists teach, say, oh, I can agree with that, or Arminianism, oh, I can agree with that, or even antinomianism. So I'm sorry, but you've got someone up here who's a little bit messed up, but that's all right. Um, and, yep, I know that. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll just power through these, because we looked at the history about you know, antinomianism and things of that nature and where it came from, and we looked at a few points in regards to that, if we go to the next slide, uh, the law ought not to be proposed to the people as a rule of manners nor use, because we're no longer under the law, and that's a big subject in and of itself. Uh, we were redeemed from the curse of the law. Jesus was the only one who fulfilled the law, and when you receive Jesus Christ according to Romans chapter 8, the law is fulfilled in you, not because of what you could do, because you and I couldn't keep the law, but because of what Jesus did, all right? What were the two main laws, if you please, in the New Testament that Jesus gave us to do? Yes. Love God and love your neighbour as yourself. If you, um, he said this, on that hang all the points of the law, right? So if you love God, 
You're not going to go and worship idols and so on and so forth. If you love your neighbour, you're not going to go and thieve and kill and, and all of that. All right. So if you think of it, Jesus made it very simple, right? But it's sometimes difficult. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next one. Let's go through that principle two. We won't look at these. Let's go principle three and then the last one and then the next one. All right. So uh, R.C. Sproul, who is no longer with us, he's passed on now. Uh, he believed that easy believism, which came from antinomianism, is an ancient heresy uh, because antinomianism basically believe you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All right, that's that's what we believe, by the way. Because when the when the Philippian jailer said to the apostle Paul, "What must I do to be saved?" he said, "What believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy household." Right, so. The Calvinists, and I'm saying this, these are pretty hardcore guys. So you've got Calvinism, then you've got hyper-Calvinism. Um, and, and, you know, I know, it's just, yeah, man likes to, and by the way, it's not just limited to Calvinism, it's limited to, it's, not, it's, it's unlimited to everything. You, you think about Baptists, we can go to an extreme, right? Baptist bride is, a, is an extreme and so on and so forth. So... Um, when you think about hyper, now I say, let me just say this. I, you know, I don't think I said this last week. I don't believe John Calvin set out to have his doctrine go to the extreme that it went. And I'll say this also that there are some Calvinists who do believe in witnessing, sharing their faith, because they don't know who's going to get saved. Neither do I, by the way. I don't know who's going to get saved and who's not. That's why we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All right, in, his, in God's foreknowledge. He knows. Amen? God foreknows who he's going to get saved. So they thought, they believed that antinomianism was a heresy because it was easy to believe. Well, it's not hard to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, next slide. Uh, we looked at lordship salvation, which again, uh, the John MacArthur's and the Paul Washers and uh, the, the, the Steve Lawson's, and you might know who are those guys. These are all part of that. John MacArthur crowd believe in lordship salvation. If he's, not, if he's not lord of all, he's not lord at all is what they'll say. So you've got to make Jesus lord. If you haven't made Jesus lord of your life, then you're not saved. And if you're not a disciple, then you're not saved either because a part of discipleship is a part of your salvation. Um, you can be a Christian but not a disciple. Right? You, you, look at, you, you think about Christianity, you get saved and you become a Christian. The next step for Christians is to be a disciple. right? And then from the pool of disciples, the Lord chooses leaders out of that. That's a biblical principle that you see where you've got those that believed in Jesus. Think about the 12, they believed on the Lord, they became his disciples because that he was their master. And then out of that, Jesus, well, he called them apostles, but then out of that you had Peter, James and John who were the leaders of the, first, the church there at Jerusalem. All right, so you can be a Christian but not a disciple. It's good if you're a Christian to be a disciple, but if you're not, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. All right, next slide. All right, we looked at some uh, of John MacArthur. Salvate, this, this is very interesting. He, now, he said this in regards to a book he wrote called Hard to Believe, page 93. Salvation isn't the result of an intellectual exercise. It comes from a life lived in obedience and service to Christ. I don't know about you, but I put work salvation right there. All right, Because when you're talking about a life lived in obedience and service, that's doing something. And so therefore, we could almost say that he's talking about a progressive salvation or a progressive sanctification. Okay, So you've got to be very careful with some... And, and the thing is this, is that John MacArthur teaches some very good stuff. Teaches some very good stuff. But when you delve deeper and you start getting right into it, he, they make quotes and they think, what in the world is he going on about, right? Anyway, next slide. All right, all right, we're in our notes now. So um, that's the, probably a fill-in that you've got there in your notes. We're going to get to that in a minute. I want to talk about moral free will and spiritual free will. Because one of the, we put in our statement that we believe that man has a free will to choose, all right? Now, there are those who will say that man doesn't have the right or the free will to choose because he's incapable of doing that. Uh, I left a little bit of a thought last week, which, uh, which is interesting. Do or did angels have a free will back in the day? 
And it was like, oh, you've got to understand, when you read your Bible, most of the Bible is after the flood or after the fall, which is after when Satan fell as well. Now, we see Satan all through the scriptures, right? So in order for Satan to, to draw a third of the angelic hosts from heaven, they, to me, now you may differ and that's fine, to me they must have had a choice. They must have had a choice to follow Satan if Satan was sort of deceiving them or whatever. And I would say, did, so Satan being a creator, but he didn't have a choice. He chose to rebel. You know, he chose to rebel. Now, let's have a look at Mark chapter 5. If you have your Bibles with you, let's go to Mark chapter 5. We'll get to this point in a moment. And I just want to share some things with you as to why... I, I believe that man, un, unregenerate, unsaved man is depraved. All right? There's no doubt that when we look at humanity today, there is a depravity. Would you agree with that? Man is depraved. But is he that depraved that he can't choose between right and wrong? No. No, everyone, everyone gets to choose whether what's right and what's wrong. There, there, God has created in us a conscience, right? Why is it there are some people in our society who end up being murderers and some who don't? Because it's a choice. It's a choice, right? So total depravity, is man that depraved that he cannot choose? And one of the illustrations that I like to go to in Mark chapter 5 is the demoniac at Gadarene. All right, so let's have a look at it. He says uh, in verse 1 there, he says, They came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. He had often been bound with fetters, verse 4, and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, and they could, uh, and there could any man tame him. And I like that. That's an interesting phrase, because when you think of taming someone, you think of taming an animal, don't you? This guy must have been pretty animalistic. Always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. So there was some self-harm happening there. Why was that? Well, he was, he was, filled with a legion of demons, right? So I don't know whether you could get any more depraved than this guy. I mean, he's got a legion of demons there, right? So, but, look at verse 6, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now, if he was that depraved that he couldn't make a choice, why would he run to Jesus and worship him? Did Jesus call him? No, he saw Jesus and he decided, he chose to go to him, right? For he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he said, what is thy name? And of course, Legion, he says, my name is Legion. He dealt with that. Verse 15, and they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and the, and the Legion sitting clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. What a blessing it is for that man that when he came to Christ, he was now a different person, right? But he saw Jesus and he went to him and he worshipped him. So that, that is what I, one of the illustrations that I used if someone says to me, well, man is that depraved that he cannot choose whether to receive God or not, whether to receive Christ or not. Well, I think this guy was pretty depraved, all right? And what about, Cameron and I were talking a while back about free will within Christianity. How much free will do we have now that we're believers? I mean, has our free will changed? Do we have a limited free will? No, no I believe God created with, it, with a free will. He created you again. Before you were saved, you had the means to choose between right and wrong. right? And now that we are saved and we've got the Holy Spirit, which we should be led of the Spirit, and the Spirit would not lead us into anything wrong, right? But we also understand that we have an, a, a, a nature, a, a human nature, right? Of, we're still dealing with that. All right, the sinful side of man and, and the flesh. And sometimes the flesh does get the better of us, does it not? So there is within that you have a choice. Sin, by the way, is a choice. Sin is a choice. First John 2 1 says, If any man sin, we have an advocate. If. 
Now, it's hard for us to understand because most people don't like to think about this because you sit and hear a lot of people like, well, I sin every day. I sin every day. You don't have to sin every day. It's a choice. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'll put this out there, I'm sure that you don't sin every day. I'm sure there are days where you get through the day on fire for God, led of the Spirit, things are going so well, you're praying, you're reading, you, you know, your thoughts are going well and all of that, but then the next day could be totally, it could be totally different, right? But, you know, you don't have to sin. What about Adam and Eve? Let's go to Genesis 2, Adam and Eve. When you think about the garden, what a perfect environment. Would you agree with that? I mean, Adam and Eve were, were perfect, right? God created... Man from the dust of the ground in the image and likeness of God created he man and then, and then he created, took woman from the rib and created woman and Adam was very pleased about that and God said, you know, you choose to what we will call her, we'll call her woman, she was taken from man and so on. So they, they were perfectly created, they were in a perfect environment and they had a perfect father. That's a really good thought for us as parents too because when you think about that, we, we, we lament sometimes when our kids make bad decisions or they go wrong or whatever it is. Hey, listen, and, and as parents we tend to beat ourselves up a little bit but then you've got to stop and think, well, hang on, God was a perfect father. He had at that time perfect kids and they were in a perfect environment but they fell. All right, they fell. Did they have a choice? Did they have a choice? Well, when you read through Genesis 2 and 3, you know that verse number, chapter 2, verse number 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou shalt eat, thou shalt surely die. Can I ask you a question? If God did that, if God put him in the garden and said, Look, here are all these trees. Look at all these trees. You can eat of all of these trees, but that one over there. Is he not giving man... The choice. Of course he is. Of course he is. And so therefore we know what happened. They chose, they sinned, they fell. You know, they, they succumbed to all of that, the fall of man. But aren't you glad in the foreknowledge of God, he knew all of this was going to take place and he already had a plan set up. Already had a plan set up. Uh, what about the prodigal son, Luke 15? Did he have a choice to leave the father? And I, I always look at the prodigal son. I don't see the prodigal son as an unsaved boy. A lot of people preach it that he was unsaved. Well, God was his father. God is not the father of every human being. Did you know that? Don't fall into the trap of belief. Well, God is the father of us all. He's only the father of those who are born again. Because Jesus said to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, year of your father the devil. So when we got saved, we were adopted. So what does adoption mean? Well, you're taken from one family and you're put into a better family, so to speak, right? And we were when we got saved. So the prodigal son, did he have a choice? Of course he did. He chose to leave the father. Now, he suffered according to his choices, did he not? But did the father still love him and receive him back when he came back? Of yeah. course. And he made a choice. <laughs> He's like, what am I doing sitting here? You know what I mean? I, I'm thinking of all the servants at home. They're living better than what I am. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home and, and confess to, before the father. And we know the story there. So, you know, even with, within the bounds of Christianity, everyone has a, has, a, has a free will to choose. Has a free will to choose. You, you and I... Before we were saved and after we were saved, we're not made robots. We love God because he first loved us. That's a choice. That's a choice that we get to make. In Acts chapter 7 and verse number 51, I know you've got that in your notes there. Acts 7, 51, Stephen is preaching and he says to all that were there, all the Jews that were there, he says, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. So if... Grace was irresistible, or if the call of God was irresistible, why are they resisting? You can have a look at Acts chapter 7, verse number 51. Did they have a free will to resist? Yes, they did. They did. So let's have a look at this now that those accepting the call are chosen. And I want you to go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22.
Matthew chapter 22. I've got your glasses here too, Jack. Look at verse number 14. Who has heard this before? For many are called, but few are chosen. Right? And sometimes that's preached as a standalone verse, but when you've, got, you've got to look at it within the context. All right? So many are called, few are chosen. So who are those that are chosen? Well, God, God chose them before the... You know, God chose them and, and because they were chosen to go to heaven and others were chosen or elected or whatever to go to hell. No, no, no. Let's have a look at something here. Let's go to the beginning of the parable, verse number one. It says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. So they were called, but they refused. Would you agree with that? Is that right? So this is so again, you see the, the Calvinists will say, well, it's an irresistible call. You cannot resist the call of God. Well, they resisted. Right? And again, verse 4, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My ox and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servant and entreated them spitefully and slew, slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt up their city. Well, there's so much in that too when you, when you think about the nation of Israel. Right? Verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Why weren't they worthy? They didn't accept the call. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Call them, right? So those servants which went out into the highways and gathered them all, as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. When the king was come, he saw a guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither, not having a wedding garment? And he, and he was speechless. <laughs> then said the king unto the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So, the ones who are chosen are the ones who accept the call. Okay? So it's not just a blanket, well, I have, God doesn't arbitrarily sit up and say, well, I'm going to choose Lindsay because I like Lindsay, you know what I mean? I'm going to choose her and I'm going to uh, predetermine that she go to heaven. Ruth, I'm not too happy about Ruth, right? She's got, she's got some issues. I'm going to choose her and predetermine her to go to hell. Okay. When you think about that, does that fit the nature of God? No. Even the nature of God is not like that. Now, is God or is he is he terrible? Is he to be feared? And all? Like, oh, absolutely. But did he not provide salvation for all of mankind? Right. And we'll have a look at how we're called at the moment. But this parable, Jesus is telling us that there are a certain group that were called to the wedding, and they said no. They resisted. So, so the Lord says, go somewhere else and you bid those out in the highways and the hedges. Great thing for soul winning. We ought to be sharing our faith. And those who accept the gospel, those who are drawn and who are called and who receive Christ, they're the ones who are chosen. And they're the ones who are the elect. So brethren, let me just say this. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, those who are the elect are you and I who are in Christ. Amen. You and I are chosen. We are a chosen generation, the Bible says. Because a lot of people say, well, what about Israel? We're going to teach on this one day, dealing with Israel and the Jews and where they play now and all this sort of stuff. One day we'll get to that. We may even look at it as we go through the book of Revelation when we go through all of that. But the idea is this, is those who accept the call are the ones who are chosen. We don't know... Who is going to receive Christ as Saviour? That's why we've been given the mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Only God knows. Only God knows. And, and when we think about that, we think about his foreknowledge. And foreknowledge, according to God, plays a huge part. So God's foreknowledge before the foundation of the world. 
All right, I'm going to choose some people to read some scripture. Let's, uh, one of those ladies up the back. Uh, who wants to read a scripture up the back? Carol, Carol, choose you. Let's go to 1 Peter 1.2. 1 Peter 1.2. I might get uh, Rod. Would you read John 6, 64 and 65? And then we're all going to go to Romans chapter 8. All right, we're all going to go to Romans chapter 8. Now, let me just, again, let me reiterate this. There are some Calvinists who do believe in what we would class as soul winning. They do believe in preaching the gospel. There are those that would say that Spurgeon was a Calvinist, but he preached the gospel because he didn't know who was going to get saved. So it's only really the hardliners, the hardcore guys that really believed that God has chosen and predetermined. And then they don't witness, by the way. They don't witness. Remember years ago, growing up in our church in Adelaide, uh, you know, really, I guess the first time I ever came into contact with it, we had um, uh, a couple in our church, an older couple. He was, uh, he was a Calvinist and we were going out witnessing, street witnessing. He said, no, 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 I don't, I don't do that. I said, oh, okay, well, how come you don't go out and witness? Because God's already predetermined. You see? You see? So, you know... I don't agree with that. You you may agree with that. I don't agree with that. All right, first Peter chapter one verse two. And act according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Neglect according to the foreknowledge of God. You see, you gotta understand God had everything planned out before everything went bad. Okay, he, 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 he knew who was going to get saved. He knew who, he, the call goes out. He knew those who would accept and then the foreknowledge and so on and so forth. Let's have a look at John 6, 64, 65. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me Except it were given him, sorry, except it were given unto him of the, my father. Right. So Jesus knew from the beginning. Was Jesus way back in the beginning? Of course he was. All right. So Jesus knew from the beginning. He knew those, even when you think about the disciples and he called them unto himself, he knew that, that Judas was going to betray him. So when we think about when we think about foreknowledge, we can't take the foreknowledge of God out of salvation or out of sovereignty. Sovereignty, we often think of sovereignty as arbitrary power, and, and it is. When we think about sovereignty, in, in a sense, it is that power, that authority. We looked at it last week. But again, in his sovereignty, God has given man the free will to choose. All right. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse number 29. It says, For whom he did foreknow, all right, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. You see, when you got saved, that, you, you were predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You, there's, there's no way around it. God is working on you to be like his Son, Jesus. All right? He's working on all of us. That might be, uh, let me see, moreover, verse 30, look at this. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them, he also called, and whom he called them, also justified, and whom he justified them, he also glorified, right? So when you think about that, you, it all depends on where you put predestination. Do you put predestination before, or do you put it after the salvation? So before would be God has predetermined or predestined, Certain ones to go to heaven, certain ones to go to hell, or predestination happens after you get saved. It's like I was watching, I know I'm weird, but I was watching a documentary the other day about uh, the train. Is it the spirit of uh, Queens, Queensland that travels from Brisbane up to Cairns, is it? Right. I was amazed. I loved it. I'm like, oh man, I wouldn't mind having a ride on that thing, right? So when you think about going on a train journey, that train has already got a predetermined destination. Right, and what you do, even before you've bought the ticket, it's got a predetermined. So you buy the ticket, you get the ticket, and you hop onto the train. It's already predestined to go somewhere, and that's what salvation is like. You receive Christ as your uh, as your saviour, and you jump on the train, and you're you're predestined. 
predetermined to go somewhere, to be conformed to the image of Christ, and aren't you glad that one day our final destination is going to be eternity with the Lord? All right. So again, you look at that, he called, he justified. Those that he called in, in, his, in his foreknowledge, he justified, he glorified. And everyone here today that's been born again, right? God foreknew it, you've been called, you've been glorified, you've been justified, you've been sanctified. It's all happened. And now, and now we are being conformed to the image of Christ. We're trying to serve the Lord. We're trying to do what's right in his eyes and so on and so forth. And one day we'll see him. That'll be a wonderful day. All right, let's go to second. We're called by the gospel. Let's go this. Let's go to second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians, uh, yes, did I say, what did I say? Second Thessalonians, yeah, two, look at verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to obtain, uh, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He called you by the gospel, okay? And remember, those that were chosen were those that were accepted the call. So when you, when you preach the gospel, you're putting a call out to people to get saved so that they can enjoy, if you please, the benefits of being a born-again believer. Okay? But if we don't preach the gospel, how is anyone going to know? Romans 10 says that. How shall they hear except someone be sent? And, and the gospel's got to be preached. It's got to be proclaimed. You are... You are inviting people or calling people to receive Christ so that they can have their names written in the Lamb Book of Life, their sins forgiven, justified, sanctified, purified, all of that. It's a call. And people either receive it or reject it. God knows who's going to receive it and God knows who's going to reject it. But we don't. That's why we preach the gospel. A friend of mine we used to go out door knocking every week and, and he would say that a mate of his would say, let's go win the elect. <laughs> Meaning that, that, you know, there are those that God had already knows who was going to get saved and they're already elect and so on and so forth. All right. So we're called by the gospel. You know, I'm certainly glad. I don't know what your testimony is in life. My, my testimony is, is that we, none, none of our family were churchgoers or anything like that. We... You know, they were Church of England. You know, they say we were Church of England. That's just the thing that you say. It's like some people say, well, I'm Roman Catholic, but they never go to church. It's just something that people say. And then one day we had a pastor and his deacon at the time knock on our door and invite the family to church. And I didn't know anything about that till one Sunday morning. I got up and mum had all the good clothes out. And we're like, what, what are we doing? And we didn't have a choice. No, we didn't have a ch choice. <laughs> there was no free will in our family, right? Oh, no, you know. You're, oh, she said, you're going to church. And I'm like, oh, what? So anyway, we, the church was held in our primary school and we went along and we we're in Sunday school and all of that. And then one day Sunday school was out and, and the preacher, every Sunday morning, all those guys back in the day would preach an evangelistic message in the morning and then the church message at night. But it was always a gospel presentation in the morning. And as I remember as a 10-year-old, he was preaching about salvation and about the Lord. And, and I knew I needed to get saved. And, and I heard the gospel and, and I knew in my heart. And I accept, I went forward and had a look at the scriptures. Someone showed me in the scriptures how I could be saved and so on. And, and I just asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. But it didn't come about by any other means but through the call of the gospel. The Spirit of God drew me. You know what I mean? And, and, and I believe, personally I believe, and you may differ and that's fine, but I, I, I do believe you can resist. And it's not God that's, oh, I'm not, you, no, you can't get saved. Whosoever will is still in the Scriptures. Now, there are some who say, well, the whosoever will are those that who have been saved, those that have been predetermined, those who are elected. God, for God so loved the world that he gave his, that he gave his own, but that whosoever believed in him should, should not perish but have everlasting life. And the gospel is for everybody, you know. 
All right, the desire of God. Let's have a look at this, the next one, the desire of God. Uh, Cameron, why don't you read 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9? Michael, would you, Michael Ross, I think there's a couple of Michaels here, but I'll better make sure. Michael Ross, would you read 1 Timothy 2, 4? <laughs> Carly. <laughs> <laughs> the brother dobbed her in. <laughs> Acts chapter 10, verse 34. It's only because Robert didn't want to get called out. Don't pick me, don't pick me. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's not willing that any should perish. You know, the amazing thing is, is that when you think about end times and you think about, you know, there, there are people that, will, that believe that people are going to get saved in that, in that seven-year period, and I believe that too. I believe that people are still going to get saved. You know, it's amazing that when, when and again, we'll look at this in the future, when God sealed the 144,000, you know that, that God was still trying to get his message out? I mean, you think about the mercy of God. You know, even in, the, even in that darkest hour, God was still calling. God is not willing that any should perish. Now, the sad reality is that there are those who are, right? There are those who reject. There are those who don't want to know anything about it. And don't, don't I know it's disappointing when you're witnessing to people and you, you want to see them saved, especially if it's family or whatever it is. You just got to share the gospel. You've got to leave it up to the Spirit of God through the gospel to draw people and, and see them get saved. You can't save anybody. You can, I can't save anybody. Our job is just to share the gospel, it's just to preach the gospel. But he's not willing that any should perish, all right? Uh, 1 Timothy 2 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? All right? That's, that's his desire. All right, Acts 10.34. And Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God has no respect for persons. He's no respect. So what does that mean? So if God were a respecter of persons, he'd come to Les and say, Les, I, I, look, I like you. You're a nice guy. I love your beard. Looks really good. And, uh, you know, I'm going to have you go to heaven and I respect you. But then if God says no and comes over to Michael, sorry, mate, I know you, you, you just visitor here. <laughs> If God said, nah, you're going over here, am I being a respecter of persons? Of course. But God is not... I tell you what God is a respecter of. He's a respecter of faith. He respects those that put their faith and belief and trust in him because that's what we all should be doing. When we hear the gospel, we responded to that. You know, some people took a, a number of times with the sharing of the gospel before they got saved. And so what does that mean? You, you rejected it at the first time. Look, no, nah, I'm not sure. I'll think about it. And you go back. Yeah, look, I'm still thinking about it, still thinking about it. And then one day down the, down the track, they got saved. Uh, my grandfather was, I think, the last one in my household, our household, to get saved. And that was years after we came to Christ. And my grandmother was as subtle as a sledgehammer when it came to witnessing and leaving things out. And he worked afternoon shift and every time he'd come home from afternoon shift, there'd be all this Christian paraphernalia. My, my grandmother, this was back in the day, before she went to bed, she would set the table for the, for the day before. So all the plates were out, everything was there, the cereal was on the table and Pop always had his spot and... And where he sat, there was just tracks everywhere. <laughs> like, you know, get the point, you know. And you know the chick tracks? Anyone remember chick tracks? I mean, those things were really subtle, right? No, they weren't. They were just straight to the point. But it was through tracks and through witnessing and through inviting that years later he came to church and he was probably one of the one of the best doorman that we had we had at the back in the day be on the door the only problem that he had that the pastor had to talk to him about was that he would literally take that verse greet the brethren with a holy kiss oh. right <laughs> but it wasn't the men that he would kiss on the cheek all the ladies that would come in it would be like a peck on the cheek and all this and pastor would say look jim just 
just shake their hands and whatever, you know what I mean? He's really good at his job. But it took years for him to get saved. You know, that's why it, you could have given up on the first shot, you know what I mean? So we, we witness, we, because God desires, he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. What? Okay, let me finish with this. Who, who was hell created for? That's it. That's it. That, that was who hell was created for. Because, again, in the foreknowledge of God, he made a place that he was going to judge unrighteousness. And the devil and the, and the, 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 the beast, the false prophet, where are they? they're going to go into the lake of fire and all of that. But unfortunately, God is just and he judges sin. So if, if the people reject, then he has no... He, he can't but judge that and say, well, you rejected. I tried calling. I sent preachers. I sent prophets. I sent people. And you, you rejected that. So you want to pay for it yourself? Away you go. So that's the unfortunate thing. Amen? All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. We thank you for your sovereignty. And Lord, we thank you that in your sovereignty you have allowed man to choose and to reject. And so, Lord, we thank you for all that have chosen to receive you through that call, and we appreciate that. But may we as your people be mindful that we need to be busy sharing the gospel so that you can call people through the gospel still. And we thank you for that. Bless our fellowship time now in Jesus' name. Amen.